you want to eat foods that encourage you to eat less. Okay. So here's why that's so important. When you look at the data on sugar, on inflammatory fats, on certain components of food that have been shown to have negative effects, a lot of that gets erased when the calories are low. Okay. In fact, and I, and I know I'm oversimplifying. Okay. So that's a fact, but it's, you even have people uh, who purport that calories are everything, which they are not, but they're very important. And they'll do something like, I'm going to eat an all McDonald's diet and I'm going to show you improvements in my blood numbers, my blood lipids and my markers. I'm going to show you, I'm going to lose weight. And they do. Now it's because they're carefully controlling their intake. All right. You don't want to live that way. Right. And obviously if you try to just eat McDonald's or yeah. processed foods, talk about their cravings that they create. Yeah, you're going to eat, you're going to overeat. Yeah. So try to eat foods that you know will make you want to eat less because that's the state you want to be in long term or most of the time, because it's going to not feel like you're white knuckling this entire process. All right. So what are those foods? Whole natural foods, high protein foods, period. End of story. Yeah. Those fiber produce the most satiety and fiber. Thank you very much. So high protein fiber, whole natural foods. Those have been shown to hit that satiety button on you very quickly. Meaning it's hard to overeat in comparison to other ways of eating when you're eating a diet that's high in fiber, protein, and only whole natural foods. Take those things out, and then you're stuck with this. I got to count calories. I got to watch what I'm eating. Oh, my God, I overate. Oh, I have all these cravings. And you're just, you're fighting this constant feeling, which uh, that's torture. And that's not going to last very long. You're going to lose that battle. This this Thanksgiving, my my nephew, who's a uh, senior in high school, is really getting into weightlifting and training now. And and he was asking me lots of diet questions, right? And- I asked that one of the things I asked him was, you know, have you ever tracked your protein intake and hit it every day for 30 days before? And he's like, oh, 30 days? No. And I'm, like, and I'm like, how often do you miss days? Oh, yeah. You know, I said, listen, I don't want you to do anything else. That's literally all I want you to do is hit your body weight in protein, your goal body weight where you want to be at, right? And just focus on that. I didn't even tell him to avoid processed foods. I said, as long as you hit your protein intake, then I'll even- Just start there. Yeah, Yeah. just start there because what I know is going to end up happening in order to hit- your, your protein intake through yeah. you, through whole natural foods, you're going to get full. You got to allocate everything in that direction. Yeah, and I even said to him, I'm not going to tell you you can't enjoy that ice cream every once in a while or eat out with your buddies with that. Just make it a goal that you first hit your protein intake, okay, and then you can do those other things. And so that's our first thing, like nutritionally. And he's, like, and he's asking me all these other questions about carbs and pre-workout and the anabolic window yeah. and all this other. I said, don't even worry about none of that yet. Just just do this. Watch what we're watch the change between that and your lifting weights because I know he's already training. He's following one of the programs. I'm like, I watch what I'm going to show you in the change in your body composition and your strength just from that, and then we'll add to that other stuff later. Now, Adam's talking about is hitting your target body weight, uh, and we say target body weight because if you're overweight and you want to lose weight, you don't want to use the current body weight. You want to use where you want to be. You hit your hit your target body weight in grams of protein. That's hard. I want everybody to understand this right now. It is not easy. I challenge you to do this for more than three days in a row. Watch what happens. If you're a 130 pound female or you want to weigh 130 pounds, eat 130 grams of protein day in and day out. And I promise you what you're going to end up feeling is full. You're going to say, I can't eat this much food. Now, here's what's funny about that. You'll end up eating less calories also. Yep. The pro on a gram per gram, calorie per calorie basis, Protein produces the satiety of something like 20, 30% more calories. So when people hit their, their targets and pro, I mean, I used to do this with clients. This, I, it took me too long to figure out. I wish I knew this. I figured this out early on, but when I would tell clients to do this, the struggle was not I mean, early on in my career with clients. The struggle was how to get them to eat less. Oh, you ate over eight. Oh, you got too many cravings. Oh, I know it's really tough. You got to just have the discipline. You got to really, you know, you got to be strong. You can do this later. The argument or the, the, the discussion was, you missed your protein. You missed, you got to eat protein. You got to miss it. And they would always tell me, I can't. Sal, I'm eating too. I can't do it. I just, I just don't want to eat anymore. And they would all get leaner as a result because it crushes, it completely crushes your appetite. The other thing that I love about that is because we've learned over all these years of training people, the psychology around not telling them they can't have something. Of course. And that's what I was doing with him was like, listen, I'm not going to tell you, you can't have your mom's favorite apple cobbler pie or whatever. I'm not going to tell you, and especially around these holidays, 
But what I'm going to tell you is just do this first, and then uh, then I'll allow you to have those things. But what I know ends up happening is the point you're you making. You don't want right? it. Yeah. yeah. And the people that fail at this, what they do is they hear that advice. They go, oh, wow, he's saying I can not I can do that. And then they end up inserting that food they want in Bef the middle of the day. Before they hit their protein. Before they hit their protein yeah. intake. Then they get full. Then they, and then they come back and say, I've been doing what you told me, and I'm just <laughs> not. And I'm like... It's because you're not listening all the way here. You have to first hit the protein intake. So if you have this food or this thing that you feel that you want so bad, wait till you hit your target. Yeah, just make that deal with yourself. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna eat it later today. After I hit my protein intake, then I'll allow myself to have that and just watch what happens. Psychologically, uh, failing because you couldn't restrict yourself feels a lot worse than failing because you couldn't feed yourself more. When you're trying to lose weight, that is a very, very, there's a very big difference psychologically. One of them feels like punishment, restriction. The other one feels like, oh my God, I got to, I got to put, throw more food in my, my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. This is really tough. And it's, it's just a much better strategy. So eat in a way that'll make you naturally want to eat less protein, fiber, whole natural foods, avoid heavily processed foods. Cause those definitely will make you want to overeat. You have to have a plan for the year, not just the plan. Like I'm going to start you know, uh, this week, but rather what is this going to look like for the whole year? And I'm going to give you a little newsflash here. The plan doesn't look the same all year. Mm -hmm. So the plan is not going to be, I'm going to work out three days a week. That's what I'm going to do for the rest of the year. The more you can get into and break down what you're going to accomplish through the year, the more you can kind of map it out, the better your success is. There's more to look forward to. You know what to expect. Um, and you know you're moving in a particular direction to get to the next level and next level. Well, the better the plan, the um, you know the, the the less wasted energy and the less um, deflated you get with uh, the lack of results or whatever it is that's actually driving you uh, towards making these changes. It's it all has to be realistic, and you have to really take an honest um, account for your habits and what you will actually duplicate and repeat and then what sounds something reasonable that um, you, you'll be able to come back and and keep incorporating on a frequent basis I, I just think like too this is this is a really important piece uh, to really kind of paint uh, the entire year for you so that way your odds of success are way higher what why do you guys think the majority don't have a plan they don't know how to plan they don't know how to plan for this right oh, so they okay. think that they're going to go to the gym and they're going to go from where they're at now, I don't know, 30 pounds overweight, deconditioned to lost 30 pounds, feel good and fit. And they think the way to get there is just to go and work out, which that's true, but there's more to it, right? Yeah. Like I, you would I, never train a client. So I, so I would, um, maybe I would, ref I would rephrase this because I bet there's lots of people that are going, oh, that's not me. I have a plan. They just have the wrong plan. Mm, sure. I, I think that's actually more common than not. I think that many people are the, the most common, you know, gym goer or person that sets this fitness is not somebody who's like, Hey, I've never worked out in my life. That was a very small percentage. Like when I, when January rolled around and I was taking inventory of the, the, the types of people that were coming into the gym. Sure. You had, a, you had a percentage that were like, Hey, I've never done this in my entire life before. I'm trying to figure that, you know, th but that's a very small percentage. Most people are like, They've been in and out of the gym for years, sometimes decades, and this is just kind of part of the the the, the what they always do. It's like yeah. they well, one thing that they've never done is been able to be consistent. Yeah, that's what they're new to. For Th this sure. is true. Okay, they're they're that that's true. But a lot of that also is because again, I think they go in with a plan, but the plan is a a failing plan. It's it's not sustainable, and that what ends up happening is they eventually get burnt out. So I actually would think that a lot of people listening to this. Here you say like, oh, you know, a lot of people don't have a plan. They're like, oh, well, that's not me. I have a plan. And the and the plan many times is is too simple. It's too, oh, I'm just gonna eat less, get rid of my bad food, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come well, in and well, I'm gonna train myself five seven days a week. That's 100 percent what I mean by no plan is that their plan. It, it would be like again, I'll use the example of building a house. I'm like, hey Adam, I'm gonna go build a house. You're like, well, what's your plan? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna work on it every day. That's not the plan. Like, okay, yeah, you're gonna work on it. Yeah. But what does that look like? What does the, each step look like? I bought all the materials. They're all there. I'm just going to put it together. Yeah. So, so okay. So what does this look like? Let's give people some takeaways, right? So first off, you want to set realistic goals. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they're starting on a fitness journey or they start, or they're, they're all of a sudden have this new motivation is that they, 
They set goals based off of their motivated, their current motivated state of mind. This is a terrible time to make, to, to base goals off of that motivated state of mind because that motivated like, state uh, of mind. It's like grocery shopping when you're hungry. Yeah, exactly. It, <laughs> that strategy. Eventually yeah. it goes away, right? So like you think like, I'm, oh my God, I feel so, I'm so motivated right now. Well, how many days a week can you realistically work out? Oh, four days a week. Well, right now, but what about when this motivated state of mind eventually goes away, which it will, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a feeling and it comes and goes. So your goals have to be based on knowing yourself and saying the following, what can I do now that I think I can maintain forever? Like, what, what can I do now that I think I can maintain forever? Like, what does that look like? And then what kind of weight loss does that look like? Or what kind of strength gain or whatever your goal is, does that look like? So you want to set this goal up and then you want to break it down into smaller goals and then phase out your year. And by the way, this is how I used to sell personal training. If I had somebody sitting in front of me and my goal was to sell them a year's worth of personal training, I wouldn't just say, well, that's going to take 150 sessions. Yeah. I would say, here's what the first two months are going to look like. And here's what we're going to focus on. We're going to work on stability, mobility. I'm going to try and alleviate some of that back pain. Then the next, the next couple months, we're going to focus on really building strength. And here's what you can expect. The faster metabolism, your appetite's going to go up. You're going to start to feel more tight and solid in your body. Then the next phase, and then I would go through and break this down for them and show them the plan. And now they know like, oh, that's how I can get there. But for somebody who does this for themselves, you know what to expect. Well, for the next two months, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on eating more vegetables. And I'm going to focus on, because I haven't done any strength training, I'm going to try and get good at like three exercises. And then after that, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove sugar from my diet and I'm going to work on really building strength. And then after that, I'm going to focus on endurance and stamina. And I'm going to try to add more protein to my diet. And by doing this, you have something to look forward to, but you've also built yourself out a plan. Now there's good and bad plans, but at the very least planning it out in this way, you have at least something that you know you're working towards. Well, and to kind of go back to a bit of, um, I know Adam was talking about like coming in with the wrong plan. Um, sometimes it takes that uh, consultation with an actual qualified coach that's a good coach or, you know, you listen to a lot of the advice we try to give is most of the clients I've uh, had in this state that have this motivation, want to lose a lot of weight and get after this, have to build their body back up and have to build back, um, you know, healthy, thriving metabolism and to really focus on building muscle. And they're not even going to think in that direction on their own if they don't, uh, you know, aren't consulting with, with a coach that can really give them a proper assessment for that. You know, the, the audience is probably tired of hearing me reference when I competed um, but I feel like it, it, it taught me so much, um, not just about myself, but even like as a, as a, as a coach helping other people. And one of the, the epiphanies that I had was, you know, knowing that I feel confident with a training program and diet and all those things like that, um, that I didn't need, I didn't need a plan. I don't need a plan. I've been a fitness professional for over, you know, two decades now at that time I wasn't two days was like 15 years at that time. Um, you know, why do I need to write out a plan or how like, but boy, because it was only because it was something that I was competitive, like it was like a sport, right? I'm going against other people. I was going to get on stage. Like I, I, and I'm competitive. I didn't want to lose. Uh, did I actually have a different attitude? Okay. Because of that, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna obviously track because I need to know for sure. And it was it was very enlightening how um, how much I overestimated things, underestimated things. Uh, even with all of my experience, um, didn't didn't know exactly what was going on with myself until I, I tracked to that level. So I can't stress enough to the audience that's listening that considers themselves very knowledgeable around program design, around nutrition on the value of actually still writing it down or laying it out for yourself for months in advance and then and then sticking to your plan. Now that doesn't mean that along the way I didn't have micro adjustments yeah. of oh scale back Always here. flexibility. Yeah, there's but but just simply having a a laid out plan for months in yep. advance of what I needed to accomplish and do. Boy, it, I mean obviously it was the the best shape of my life that I was ever in. And a lot of that was attributed to one, obviously the consistency around it, but also really having a plan to a plan of attack and sticking with it. Yeah. So, you, you know, here's an example, right? You could take the year and you can break it up into four quarters 
And then those four quarters are made up of three months. And then each of those months now is a mini goal. And then you ask yourself the following, okay, what kind of workouts? So for the first quarter, I'm going to focus on like just building strength, let's say in the bench press, the overhead press, the squat and the deadlift. That's my focus for that first quarter. So then you know what the first month's going to look like, second month's going to look like, third month's going to look like. And then you move into the next quarter. Okay, after this quarter, now I'm really going to try and focus on bringing up lagging body parts. So my routine's going to look a little different, or maybe it's going to be stamina, or maybe it's going to be mobility, but you kind of get the gist. So you want to break down your year into workout plans focused on specific types of goals. Because by the way, getting fit all these things contribute to, to to fitness, whether it's mobility, strength, stamina, you know, bodybuilding, powerlifting, whatever. They all contribute to fitness. And you, as anybody who's ever followed our programs knows, this is how we write our programs. And we write them partic- specifically so people can follow them one after another and kind of do this. So you break that down and then do the same thing with your diet and make it realistic. This is I can't make this goal for you because I don't know what your life looks like now, but make it realistic for yourself and say something like, for the first three months, I'm going to eliminate soda. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to eliminate soda mm-hmm. and I'm just going to drink water. And then the next time, the next few months, then from there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to cut all my meals down by, let's say a quarter in terms of size. So however much I eat, I'm going to cut them down by a quarter and reduce my calories. And then maybe the next couple months, now I'm going to focus on hitting my pro- protein targets, whatever. Right. So this is how you can kind of break it down and you can put sleep in there. Here, I'm going to focus on sleep. Here, I'm going to... But it's really cool because it, it gives you a plan. You know what look fo- what to look forward to. And you know where you're moving. You know that, okay, for the next couple months, I'm doing it this way. And then I'm going to be doing this other thing. I'm going to be working out this particular way versus I'm just going to the gym and just, just trying to work out and just you know do my thing. This is just a more effective way uh, of getting somebody from point A to point B. And you know, it's just- to that point, you I, on your notes here, you've, you've listed this in the fifth point, but I want to bring it up now because I think it belongs here. And when I first start off with, with any client or even myself, my own, my own routine, the first, the, the first few weeks is purely just a lot of tracking. Um, uh, yes, I have a goal in mind, but as far as like my, my plan of attack, part of that process is really getting a, a, a good inventory and assessment of where I'm currently at. How much am I moving every, every so you're talking about just tracking. Yes. Not necessarily trying to hit anything, but just let me know. No, look. no, yeah. I'm not trying to hit the, the and I know right. that's part of what, why you're talking about the tracking and the, yes. the last part is the macro piece, which that comes later. Right now, it's literally just to see where am I at. You know what? How many steps do I uh, I take on a normal day? Like yeah, how many grams of sugar am I actually exactly? Eating? How much sugar am I taking? How much fiber am I taking? How much protein intake do I take in every single day? That where's my cal- calories average per day for the week? And and get just a real good inventory on where you're currently at because that's going to be so different for every person, regardless of what your current situation that you're in, as far as body fat or, or muscle. Yeah. Plus it makes it easy when you're way more realistic that way, yeah. because then it's actually um, something that like you can see, like I'm, I tend to lean towards these habits and this doesn't, this doesn't like take me too far away from my actual daily routine. It's pretty close, but I can make micro adjustments that don't impact me too much. And then it's something I can repeat. Yeah. And it also allows you to make those changes because, um, you know, I'm adding more vegetables. Am I really adding a significant more vegetables or, or I'm, I'm trying to eat more protein, but am I really, cause you don't know where you were at before. So I like that. It's really about bringing awareness and with nutrition. The reason why it's so important with nutrition is most people, actually everybody, um, miscalculates. If, if When they do surveys and ask people what they eat and how much they think they eat, people are off. off. Yeah, tremendously. It's consistent. So if you don't enjoy your workouts, something is wrong. Either your workouts or there's something wrong with you. The only way to have long-term success with exercise is to actually enjoy your workouts. So I know that came across a little harsh. Yeah, <laughs> but you may be doing it wrong. You know why I, you know why I said there's something wrong? Because... Uh, either a your workout programming is super off, right? So if you're hating your workouts, if they're making you feel terrible, like look at that. But then there's another side to it, which is um, even pro- like properly programmed workouts done correctly, they're going to be challenging, right? They have that's part of the formula, and you have to learn to enjoy that process. You have to learn to enjoy the workouts. So there's a it's a dual thing. Like is my workout wrong for me, and is my mindset wrong uh, for my workouts? That being said. I actually think this is 
a, a difficult thing for people to actually really gauge. Mm. In fact, in my experience, I've heard this many times from clients. That, oh, I love this workout, or it's my favorite way to train. And they say things like that because- Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. They've attached it to something like maybe they were in the best shape of their life when they trained that modality or nothing gets them to lose weight faster on the scale than that way of exercise. And so they say they love it. Right. There's it some association there for sure. Yeah, like I, I, I'm not buying the like, I love this workout thing. Like you can, you want to prove to me you like doing Like for example, I get people that like, I love running. You've been running for five, 10 years straight every morning. Yeah. And five, you, love you love running. Yep. Yeah. You love running. Uh -huh. I believe you. But yeah. if you tell me like, oh, I love Orange Theory Fitness and it's like that's your favorite thing to go on and off about all the time like yeah. no, no 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 i'm not buying that i'm so glad you said that one of the the like one of the hallmarks of somebody actually enjoying the workout is that they do it consistently yeah yeah and that they've done it for years and years and years consistently yes so so that's the that's the context do i enjoy this workout is this something that i want to do consistently forever and if the answer is no you're gonna have to look at the workout and maybe look in the mirror and the reason why i say look in the mirror is because there is a process of learning to love the the journey of exercise, right? Learning to love the process of exercise. That is part of this lifestyle, um, you know, this long-term lifestyle. <clears throat> but also, okay, to back to what Adam's saying, you got to look at your workout sometimes. Like if you love your workout because it beats you up, this is what a lot of people will say, right? Yes. Oh, I loved it. Why? Oh my God, I got so sore and yeah. I was so sweaty. Oh, I feel so amazing and afterwards. I feel so amazing afterwards. Yeah. Okay, let's see how long that continues with you how long have you been doing it for you know the last month okay well let's see how long that sticks around have you guys had a client that came in and they were like i just i can't stand exercising yeah, yeah. oh yeah of course. and then you're yeah. like okay but you're here <laughs> now what do we do yeah you know like that's man that's a difficult place to be but it's it's such like baby steps of introduction i yeah. actually i actually found an answer for that person right because they would oh i hate exercising exercising to me is like i think right away like the, that generation of people that would come in and hire us like attaches that to like Jane Fonda circuit classes, mm. sweating, body pump, like moving, like pushing, burning, like all that. And then I'm like, well, let's train instead. Instead of exercising, let's train. Let's, let's find something you enjoy doing or find it. Like, do you want to get yeah. stronger at this thing? Or have you ever done this type of a movement and then teach them that and be like, Hey, let's, let's get good at this. And let's focus on that. Let's not think of this as like exercise and you have to get this sweat or this burn or get like this crazy workout time. Let's let's pick something that you do enjoy doing and let's try and improve. Upon I actually that. prefer yeah. I would prefer it when a client said that to me when a new client. Oh, I hate exercise. Well, OK, well, now I'm glad we're starting with honestly. ground zero. Yes, because the person that comes in and, and hires me and says, well, I love I love running. Well, do you run? Well, yeah. no, no, I, I don't run. I have before, but I don't do it now. Like, well, you actually don't love it. Um, I, you know, you might have an association with it, but you don't really love it. So, okay. You don't love exercise. Uh, you hate it. So here's how we're going to build a relationship with exercise over time. That's going to get you to enjoy it. And one of them is why are you doing this for? Is it because you hate yourself or because you care about yourself? That's mm -hmm. a big one. Mm -hmm. Uh, number two, maybe your association with exercise, you feel ter terrible during and afterwards. Well, you know, what's going to be great about this. You're gonna. It's gonna be hard, but you're gonna enjoy it during, and you're gonna feel better after than you did before. Because that's a that's a key hallmark of a good workout is you have more energy after the workout than you did before. It invigorates you. No, that's and, a good point. I mean, I I totally see that in terms of somebody coming in with they've already had a previous experience sometimes that was like terrible, and so it like put this bad taste in their mouth in yeah. terms of like what they were going to expect going into this and like you're just going to punish them. And it's a lot of the, of it like stems from this kind of punishing mentality of, uh, you know, I have to do this is work and, uh, you know, it's painful and, and like, it doesn't, none of it has to be that way. Like we can actually like do a lot of things you actually enjoy and, and slowly kind of introduce you to things that you may not have done before. Yeah, I, I feel like it's, they attach it to, either the best shape of their life or they attach it to the best results they have currently seen the way they've done things. And I'm reminded of like when I first started dating Katrina, uh, she told me that she used to love running. And I'm like, you, what do you mean? You didn't, we, we've been dating for a while and I've never seen you run before. Well, I know I haven't had to, I need to get in shape now. And now I love to run. I'm like, okay. And then she'd go for these runs. But 
she had made that connection of that's how she managed her weight her whole life. Yeah. If I got it, if she got 10 or 15 pounds overweight in from where her normal weight is, she knew she could go hit the pavement, you know, run it, run it off. Mm -hmm. And she would get back down to that way. Therefore I love running. Mm -hmm. That's how, that's the relationship with it. Once I taught her how to strength train and speed her metabolism up and sculpt and shape her body, ha, that girl hasn't ran since then. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What happened to love and running? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like, no, she didn't love oh, running. This is better. They they love that that what happens is they they had some sort of success with that modality. And then they've now attached that to like, oh, this is my yeah. and they've probably tried other things, right? Mm -hmm. In the in the past. And that one thing showed them the most results. Therefore, I love that way of training. Yeah, and it's like, no, it. you don't though, yeah. because you you don't do it even when you're not mo to me if you love something you do it even when you're not motivated that's it you know what i'm saying like that's if you it. if you like like my brother-in-law loves downhill mountain biking that guy could go up and down and wade not care about it he is mountain biking no matter three, what no matter what because he has such a deep passion for that that is somebody who i think loves that modality of co of cardio and exercise and we can build that into his training but many times when clients would give me this bullshit thing like i love yeah. this way of and, doing you, and you can like, build no, you this don't. relationship by the way so if you're listening you're like i hate it like you're not uh, you're, our bodies were designed to move there's a relationship there that needs to get developed mm -hmm. to where you actually enjoy the process and it takes a little bit of time part of it is understanding how it makes you feel understanding the value understanding it's a form of self-care changing your relationship to pain identifying uh, uh appropriate pain with exercise, inappropriate pain with exercise. And by the way, and this is true, I of all the years I trained people, off the top of my head, and I think it was only three, there were three clients that I trained that became personal trainers. So they actually hired me, and then they trained with me for a while, and they eventually became trainers themselves. All three of them hated exercise when they hired me. It's a true mm -hmm. story. One was a kid, and he was uh, shy and embarrassed and insecure, didn't want to go to the gym. He ended up becoming a personal trainer later on. Another one was one of my first clients when I opened my studio and she would work out on and off. Anyway, she became a trainer later on. Another one was somebody that literally the day that she hired me, she said, I'm only working out twice a week with you and that's it. I'm not doing anything else. I hate exercise. All three of them changed the relationship to exercise to the point where they became trainers. It actually became the profession. Yeah. I mean, I, I went through a few of these kind of clients and, uh, you know, one of them was overweight and in a lot of pain. And it was like, there was a little bit of an experience before where the focus was just on losing the weight. And so I just completely focused on postural adjustments and mobility and, and taking her through like different ways to, to feel good and actually like, uh, you know, give her energy and, 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 and stamina and, and you know, just really slowly introducing her into like lifting weights to where it was, it was one of those things. It was a totally different experience for her. And, and then she bought in wholeheartedly once it was like, Oh man, I feel great. Now I feel like I'm motivated. Yeah. yeah a lot of it's tied to the results, right? If somebody is, I mean, it's like, how long do you go to that job and then don't receive a paycheck? I mean, and, and then also tell people you love it. Like you yeah. don't ever see that. And it feels grueling yeah, and shitty. Yeah. yeah. No. So a lot of the, I'm so glad you said that because a good job, a good career is not easy. Yeah. It's still challenging. Absolutely. But it's not grueling. What I mean by grueling is when you feel a sense of purpose behind what you're doing and something's challenging, it's not grueling. It's hard, but it's a good kind of hard. And you're right. You get the paycheck. You get the dividends. You yeah. feel it. Especially when it pays you well for what you do, yeah. what you love to do. So if you can find something you love to do and it pays you well, you really love it. And that tends to be similar to the relationship that people have with exercises. It's not easy. It's hard. And when it pays you shitty all the time, yeah. it's really tough to get yourself motivated. Why am to, I doing this? Yeah. Why am I doing this? It's not paying me the dividends that I want for the same thing for an investment that's not paying you back. Oh, I hate this type of investment. Why? Well, because it doesn't ever give you the return I want. Well, okay. Once we figure out that piece, yeah. you completely start to change your relationship. with You know, it. I, I did this yeah. with uh, nutrition, which I think is even harder. I think it's much harder to develop a good relationship with food than it is with exercise. Uh, that's a hundred percent. And I'll stand by that. But I hated fish, and I hated most vegetables for most of my life. Just didn't, I not not didn't like them. Hated them. Did not like like hated them completely. <laughs> and as I got older, and I learned more about the health benefits, and I had gone through some gut health issues, and I was I went on a trip to uh, Italy, to Southern Italy, and I said to myself, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna be open minded. I'm gonna eat more fish, and I'm gonna consciously pay attention to how it affects my body, how I feel. Over the course of that summer. I developed a relationship with seafood that now I enjoy eating. Now it's not my favorite food, so it didn't go from being something I didn't I hated to pizza, but I 
I now enjoy eating it because I saw the value and I connected that. Same thing with vegetables. I hated vegetables, but through eating them and identifying what they did for my body and my digestion, and now I actually will crave vegetables, especially when my gut health is off. That's one of the first things that I will crave will be, I'm going to get a bowl of vegetables, well-cooked vegetables, because it makes me feel good. So you, so my point with this is you can, you can create this kind of relationship, and I can't think of a better way to be consistent with exercise for the rest of your life than finding a way to enjoy what you yeah. do. Really just about the, the health benefits of daily activity or really what it's really about are the health detriments of not being active every single day. And that is to walk a little bit three times a day. So no structured cardio. I'm not getting on a treadmill and sweating my butt off. I'm not trying to ride a bike for five miles. Literally three times a day, go on a, a seven to 10 minute walk. That's it. Seven to 10 minutes, three times a day. All right, what's that going to do? All right, it's not going to make you shredded, do all that stuff. But what it will do is improve your health markers. It will improve your blood insulin and glucose levels, which helps with your behaviors. It's also a moment to be reflective, do this without any distraction. And it has a profound effect on lots of other behaviors. When you divide your day up with a, like I said, literally a seven to 10 minute walk, when you divide your day up that way, morning, afternoon, and evening, here's what ends up happening. Here's what I end up finding with clients. When they do this, every time you do that walk, your behavior is a little bit better afterwards. And then it starts to kind of trend downwards, almost like it wears off. It's almost like you take a pill that gives you better behaviors, but the half-life is very short, a few hours, right? Then you get the next walk. Oh, here we go. I'm doing it again. Nice self-reflective walk, no distractions, or maybe listen to a good book. That's good too, but I like no distractions. And now it gets you up again and then it kind of veers off a little and then do one more in the evening to finish off the day. Increases activity. That's true. But really what it does is it improves your behaviors and it helps with your overall health. And again, it's less to do about the walking yeah. and more to do with the fact that it's we lead such sedentary life, life uh, lifestyles mm -hmm. that the little bit of activity pr is profoundly beneficial because of how unhealthy the fact is that we don't move at all. And I love pairing them after meals, which we've yes. talked about. And mainly the digestion in terms of like the improved digestion uh, for myself uh, and my clients. Um, I just feel like the majority of people have gut issues. And, and that's just something I've noticed mm -hmm. over the years is like so many people, whether they know it or not, um, have a lot of digestive issues that – they could actually work on and improve through obviously better nutritional choices, but then two, uh, allowing their body this proper time to digest and and to create that movement and get all the systems working effectively. And th this is a, a great way to do that while also getting sun and getting fresh air and a lot of other benefits all kind of combined at once. Well, yeah. I think one of the worst habits that we ever created was the you know, eat a big meal and then plop your feet up on the couch and, mm -hmm. and watch a movie or TV and stuff. And I think that that's pretty common in, in not only in my own household, but in most households I've been in is that that's kind of what happens. Like everybody sits around the dinner table or eats lunch. And then afterwards they put their feet up and they watch a movie or relax. And it's like, man, you're, you will see just, and then this is a, I love just so, taking somebody who's hate and and done that for most of their life and just getting the walk to minutes, how much better they Huge. instantly feel. Yeah. It's because it's just your digestive system was not meant to lay down flat like that after getting a big meal like that. Gravity works no. in your yeah. favor when no, you're in standing fact, up. When you're, ex when you're walking, obviously the muscles of your lower body are contracting and then relaxing. This act like a sponge. It moves and they along. soak up they soak up the blood sugar that you have in your blood. So now you have better blood sugar levels, Partition, everything your, better. your insulin now, because you, you, you don't have insulin sensitivity issues because you're, you're like, a, like, it's like a sponge. Think of a sponge you put in water, you squeeze it and then you open it and it sucks things up. That's what happens. The second thing you talk about digestion, hip flexor muscles and muscles that aid in, in locomotion, right? Lower body movement. Some of these muscles go through the digestive system. I mean, almost like you look at a psoas muscle, it's a hip flexor. It goes through the body and attaches at the lumbar spine. Every time that shortens and contracts, it actually aids in the digestive process. It actually helps with, yeah. with, the, with food moving through. And um, gravity. And, gra and, and standing up. <laughs> yeah, just pulling it down, that 100%. period. And it's so, I like this one because it's so easy. Yes. A seven to 10 minute walk is like, for most people, is down the street and back. Mm -hmm. So, and, oh, you finish eating down the street and back. And for, I mean, I 
been talking about this for quite some time now. I, I think, and we one of the best benefits is just the connection with your partner. So yeah. I'm a big fan of mm -hmm. this is another time when you decide to put the phone away and any sort of distraction, and it's an opportunity for you to connect with a <clears throat> you know a partner, spouse, a child, whatever. Like this is just we live in a time now where we always have our phones in our hands or in our hip, like we're constantly attached to it. Rarely ever do you have two or three people in the same room and then one of them not always grabbing on their phone. So here's an opportunity for you to connect with the people that you love by putting those away, walking for 10 minutes, improving digestion, moving a little bit, burning a little bit extra calories, and then also connecting with people because I think it's an important part of health. Totally. Too. So, so the next thing to do, now that you've kind of loosely create a plan for yourself. You've broken up your workouts into phases and goals. So it's not just one big goal for the year, but rather how each step is going to lead to that big goal. Then what you want to do is you want to start with the big rocks. What I mean by big rocks is, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to empty debris out of a room, I'm going to move the big boulders first because one, you know, if I carry one rock out of here and it's a big boulder, that makes a lot of space versus a pebble. You know, I could pick up a pebble and walk out. My God, I'm gonna have to make a lot of trips before I really make an impact. So basically, essentially, what that means is to start with the steps that have the biggest impact so that when you make one choice, one change, you get a big return rather than a small change or a change that makes a, that gives you a very little return. This is very important because when you first get started, it's been shown in studies, and I've experienced this as well, that when people make a change and then see a big return, they're more likely to want to continue moving forward versus they make changes, don't see very much return. It's very easy to become, you know, like, oh, this is not, this is not working. Now, I want to, I want to add something to that, that I, I communicate differently today than what I did when I first started. And that is don't try and move too many big rocks at, at first, you know, choose one or two big rocks and focus on them and and execute and be yeah. consistent with it before you add more. Because a, a a mistake that I think I I made as a, as an early coach and trainer is you know someone would hire me they're all motivated like this and they'd be like all right here's all your things you know we got protein here's fiber here's you know where your sugar needs to be at here's where I want your steps to be at oh here's how I want you to be lifting and it's like uh, and those are all big rocks right sleep uh, I'm I'm naming all these things yeah, yeah. but there's so many that when you when you do that the average person can get overwhelmed even the ones that can actually persevere through that and actually accomplish some of that stuff the likelihood that they will have built good habits and routines around those new behaviors is less likely than if i were to choose a rock and find a way to implement it into their life and 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 to that they will maintain this for the rest of their life and really like hone in like does that work right there with your schedule does that what you like like and and in every aspect both the workout part the nutrition part like I'm helping my my sister-in-law out um recently and you know, one of the things that she was asking is like, well, what do you, what should I eat for this meal? And what should I eat for that? She's at, I'm like, I, I'm not worried about that right now. Right now, all we're focusing on is breakfast. Mm -hmm. Like we have not figured out how to consistently hit 40 grams of protein in your breakfast. And I'm trying to adjust it based off of the first eating pattern she gave me. Right. So I did the same thing with her. I said, listen, track your food for two weeks. Don't try and impress me. Eat how you always eat. I want to see your habits. And then when I see what's going on, I go, oh, wow, you know, for breakfast, she's like all carb, no, no protein. And that happens to be one of the big issues. We're only getting 30 to 50 grams of protein. She needs north of 130 a day consistently. And so, okay, here, where I'm going to address this first meal of the day and we're, and I'm going to build it around stuff that she was kind of already doing to mm -hmm. ask her to eat something that is dramatically different than what she is but used to making is less likely that she's going to yeah. stick with it. Yeah, and there's like a cascading effect of some of these like simple decisions that so that's a big rock because it has like a ripple effect to it, right? So it's it's something like uh and you mentioned like not drinking any more soda like for instance. So what you replace that with more water, being more hydrated, having more energy, um you know, you're mentally you're wanting to make better decisions nutritionally, you know, or it's strength training, right? It's something that's going to uh, pay you back in terms of like 
uh, building up not just your your muscles and your strength, but also to your metabolism. And so now you can actually utilize energy more effectively, uh, have you know more of an able body, which promotes more movement. And so it's like considering some of those bigger things that like it's a simple thing, but it's also too it's going to pay you in dividends. Yeah. Well, you're 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 developing the skill of changing uh, behaviors. Is what it is. So you, you if you're trying to develop a the, the if you're trying to change behaviors, you have to have a skill to do so. It's not easy. It's very hard to change behaviors and behaviors include like how active you are or not and the kinds of foods you eat. And so if you haven't made big behavior changes recently, effectively and long-term, well, you're going to do one because if you do five, the odds that you're going to succeed are really low. So you're going to do one, get good at it, try another one. Ooh, I'm getting better at this. And then you get kind of the snowball effect. But here's some examples of big rocks. These are just examples of things that have a big payback, right? So the first one would be avoiding heavily processed foods or ultra processed foods. These are foods that are found in boxes or in wrappers. They have long ingredient lists, mm -hmm. long shelf lives. Now, these foods aren't necessarily uh, inherently unhealthy, although a lot of them are. That's not the reason why we're cutting them out. We're cutting them out because, or why this is considered big rock is because this almost always leads to a significant reduction in calories, period. End of story. And they've got, they've done really, really good studies on this topic and just consuming ultra processed foods or these hyper palatable processed foods typically will, will, will drive somebody to eat north of 500 to 600 more calories a day. So simply removing these, what you'll find is you'll eat about five to 600 less calories on a daily basis. Um, so basically what you're doing is you're saying, I'm just not gonna eat these foods, but I'll eat as much as I want of whole natural foods. This usually in my experience results in like a seven to 12 pound weight loss. When I would have clients do this, they would eat as much as they wanted. They just wouldn't eat these heavily processed foods and they would lose seven to 12 pounds. There's very little things you can do. That's one step that will contribute uh, so greatly to something like, like fat loss. Um, the second thing that's a big rock would be to strength train. Of all the forms of exercise, when you're talking about bang for your buck results, when it comes to fat loss, sculpting, strengthening, strength training is the king. There's, there's nothing like it. Other forms of exercise have value, but strength training impacts the metabolism in a positive way, whereas other forms of exercise don't necessarily do this, meaning you can speed up your metabolism. You can make your body burn more calories on its own versus having to move uh, yourself. So that's why it's such a big rock. Like two days a week of strength training is way more powerful than two days a week of any other form of exercise from just an overall health, mobility, uh, and fat loss, fat loss standpoint. The next thing would be to walk more. Walking is a big rock because it's the form of activity that you're most likely to be able to be consistent doing. And it's not on a treadmill. It's just walk more throughout the day. So here's where step counter can come in handy. And you can say, wow, I average 4,000 steps a day. I'm just going to try and hit 7,000 steps a day. That's a little, almost double. And let's see what happens. And then you don't need to work out. You just need to just be conscious of moving more and walking more. That might mean you do a 10 minute walk after breakfast, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but that makes a significant impact on your health. And then the last one would be sleep, just getting better sleep because that impacts your diet, your, your eating habits, your cravings. It gives you, uh, you're more likely to feel the feeling of motivation, which if you feel motivated, you're much more likely to do the things you want to do. It balances out your hormones. Balance out hormones. Is all, so those are, the, those, are, those are common big rocks that you could tackle. But like Adam said, and Justin was uh, communicating, like start with one of them is probably what I would recommend. Yeah, either one of them or one thing in regards to each one of them. Right, Meaning right. this, like, okay, I get this client, they eat, they eat all. Let's say say they're they, they're dropping the ball on all these things. They eat tons of processed food. They uh, they don't strength train whatsoever. They don't go get outside and walk and get any activity. They have a shit sleep routine. Okay, they're they're fucking up all of them. And and now I've just told them these are all the big rocks. We've got to get this. Now what I'm not going to do is to put tremendous amount of emphasis on each one of them individually. I may take one thing from all of them. So I'm I'm looking at. My my sister in law. That's approach. That's I, I'm looking at my sister in law's diet, and let's and we're going to use her as an example as if she's the, even though this is not her, but let's pretend she's eating out every single meal and fast food and and drink cokes or something like that. I'm going to pick one or two things tops in there that I want to improve. Like say, oh, I noticed that you know dinner, you always eat out at this place. So our goal for this first month is dinner you make. 
Okay, we'll worry about the other meals. What that like dinner? We're gonna make it at home, and we're gonna we're gonna balance it out. It's gonna and we have all these different choices. I want you to choose from, but I want it to be whole food. That last meal of the day, and that's all I, I'm gonna set for that goal, right? And then the the next one is strength training. She wasn't doing any sort of strength training whatsoever, so I'm gonna start her off on like either like a maps 15 type of routine or a maps anabolic pre phase where I'm only asking her to go in and and lift weights two days a week. That's all. That's all we're gonna do. Then like her walking. She's not doing anything activity wise outside of the gym and so like that. And so I'm just going to say, Hey, every day after lunch, go for a, a 20 minute walk or something, right? It's like I'm going to say, and then sleep, right? Sleep is always messed up. I'm going to say, Hey, here's this one hack. I want you to add sun goes down, put your blue blockers on. That's all I'm going to say to you right now. I'm not going to put any more parameters around this. Just let's get in the habit of doing that yep. one thing. Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to give them very realistic, obtainable goals that could improve these big rocks and start moving us in the right direction. And the reason why I only want to do that is I want to, I want to start to build wins. Because if I ask them to, to do all those big rocks and to execute all of them, really like all no processed food, walking every single day, three times, you know, your sleep routine looks like X, Y, and Z. If I ask them to do all that, they might for a little while. But the likelihood they stick to all of it forever is less likely. And so I'm going to give them these real subtle changes in, in each one of those categories. And then I'm going to hold them accountable to them and then and give them an easy win and celebrate yeah. that win so we can start to build well, the, that momentum. I'm going to give an analogy. So um, think of it this way. If, if this isn't something that you're doing on a regular basis, it's like you're in a, a pitch black room. And this is just you're, you're in a pitch, pitch black room. This is how your eyes are adjusted. Now imagine someone someone come in and turn the lights on full blast, super bright. It is blinding. It's overwhelming. You can't process it. You got to turn up the lights slowly so that you can your eyes can adapt and it doesn't blind you and you adjust to it. So this is what these steps do because when you take a step, one step, it's hard, but you can adjust to it. And then it becomes a part of your life. And then the next step becomes another kind of hard step, but and then I adjust to it as well. You do everything at once. Because the, the idea is this. The idea is, well, if I do everything at once, I'm going to get results way faster. Kind of, but not. Because yes, initially you may see a big change, but the odds that you're going to fail of after a few months is like almost 100%. After a year, it's about 100%. So you will fail doing it this way. So you, you do need to take those steps um, and tackle, again, tackle the things with the biggest return. That's why I, I listed you know heavily processed food, strength training, walking, and sleeping because those tend to have the biggest return when you do those types of things. It's sprinting. It's sprinting versus the marathon runner. We 100 the the pursuit of health, uh, longevity, and a, and a fulfilled, healthy life is a marathon. I don't think anybody would argue that, right? It's a, it's a it's years. It's the years. longest thing you'll do. Yeah, that's it's right. Your whole so life. It's, it is <laughs> the longest marathon. So doing all those things, you absolutely can sprint out the gates. No, but. 100% a, a sprinter that runs out the gates versus the experienced marathon runner will get their ass kicked by the marathon runner eventually. You will eventually burn out and not be able to sustain that level of speed and the marathon runner will come jogging past you whether it's in one week, eight weeks, six months or a year, they will. And that all the all the studies and research point in that direction that most people end we up burning We all know up. the tortoise and the hare. If you follow it, there's all these like kind of domino effects on other behaviors. And that's really what makes it so beneficial. And, and that is to set a water goal and hit it. So uh, for most people, most of the clients I trained, I would have them aim for a half a gallon to a gallon of water every <coughs> single day. Now, mm -hmm. the bigger the person, the more that they sweat, the more protein that they consume, the more uh, water I'd have them, uh, you know, target. But half a gallon to a gallon a day. I like a gallon for most people because most people end up going just short of it because that's tough, right? And make sure it's spring water. You don't want anything distilled or without any minerals or anything like that in it. But only because a lot of water without those minerals can cause uh, actual muscle cramping and stuff like that. But set a target. So what this looks like is get yourself a bottle that you could fill up with water and 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 realize or notice how many of those bottles are required to be, let's say your target is a gallon. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a, it's four of those. So four of these thermos bottles equals a gallon and then track them throughout the day and try to hit those targets every single day. Here's what you'll find. Yeah. You'll drink less of other calorie containing beverages. That's the big yeah. one. Two, you have more energy, less pain, less pain, less inflammation, yeah. 
less tightness, uh, less tightness. Your appetite actually uh, is positively affected in less the sense brain that brain fog, less brain fog. This is a, especially if you're a busy, stress, stressed out person. I mean, how many times have, have people, how many times have, you know, you watching this right now, have you said this to yourself? Oh, I forgot to drink today. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I haven't drank any water today. It's already three o'clock. Literally. It's just set it, set a goal. Have that water with you throughout the day. Hit that water target. Watch what happens, how you feel. This is one of my favorite ones to hear you give as a tip because people that have been listening to the show long enough might remember back in the days, the guys used to tease me for carrying around a one-gallon jug. Oh, yeah. And this was actually- Mark it off. Uh-huh. Right? This was, yeah. And I actually used to teach my clients to do the same thing. So it was kind of funny. I know what the guys were, were teasing about. They were making fun of the- the gym bro with his his gallon of of water and his you know fifty supplements. Well, and, it was it was a Barbie jug that you yeah, had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this was uh, cool. Now. This was my argument that I made back then. I said no, I disagree with you guys. I actually think that that it does have some validity to it. In fact, I used to tell my clients to do it um, for this exact reason. Because if you tell someone to drink eight glasses of water, ain't none of them track. None of them count. It's too many to keep track. Yeah, or, or they start counting, and then they forget, and then they just write off. Yeah. Where having that gallon with a, a line marked on it, so let's say you're three quarters a gallon or a full gallon, which is what I would give most of my clients as a goal, is they can visually see it, yeah. they, and they know. If there's no question, Simple. is there's no question. Did I drink three of those yet, or two of those? I can't remember. Was it the fourth one I did? No. It's like there's your gallon. You started this morning. It's only that far down. And like, and then I I'd have clients even mark because they started to learn. Oh, after over time, like where they needed to be by a certain time, and they would put oh noon. They put a line where they need yeah. to be, and then four o'clock in the afternoon where they need. Yeah, because so you don't want to be caught at the end of the day. With no, you're just not going to make it. Yeah. You're not going to make it, and or you're not going to track it. And so I've always been a fan of this. And the things that I found, I mean, ironically, you get up and move, and you have to pee more. So you get up and you get those yeah. little five ten minute walks naturally because you have to go to the, the restroom all the time. Burning when calories. you're a lot of times uh, when the the signals that we have of cravings and hunger a lot of times is triggered by dehydration or just mm -hmm. having yeah. and going over and just having some some liquid or fluid will help you. It also help you from overeating. So like if you have a good glass or you're drinking water between bites, you'll see that you don't over, over consume. Uh, so there's, a, there's a lot of benefits to doing that besides just the fact that we need to stay hydrated and that's a healthy thing for you. So it's one of my favorite easy it's hacks. It's a simple one too. Yes. Very it's a simple. simple. Going to wait till you plateau before adding anything on top of what you're doing. Okay. Now, now, I think we need to define what a plateau is because when I say plateau, people think it's a plateau on the scale. Oh, that's mm. it. Everything stopped working. Mm -hmm. No. Fitness, exercise, uh, eating better has, ha has a lot to do with everything. Not just weight loss, but how you feel, your skin, your strength, your mobility, your stamina, like how well you're sleeping. So a real plateau means you're not getting anything. Not, ooh, I didn't lose weight on the scale, but I got stronger, you know, so I think I plateaued. You didn't plateau, you got stronger. Like everything's working because if you throw stuff on top of stuff that's working, you definitely run the risk of doing too much for your body and going backwards or just overwhelming yourself with too many changes that you absolutely can't stick to. This is also why I like this approach of like one single thing towards each of these big rocks is because... I give that client all these single things and then say, okay, let's be consistent for the next two to four weeks and report back. And it's like, oh, nice. We're seeing nice, slow, gradual progress. They're getting a little bit stronger or losing a little bit of body fat. Things are going good. Oh, we're starting to slow down. Well, now I can do the same thing. Now I'm going to go right back through all those big rocks again and add one more thing. So I have all these levers that I can pull every time their progress starts to slow down versus had I done everything that we could right out the gates, we hit our first plateau and then where do we go? Totally. There's nothing else I can do. Yeah, and I think it's a good point too that um, you consider there's a lot of other factors too that your body's providing you a lot more signals than just the weight or um, you know your your energy, for instance. Although those are very very valuable things to pay attention to. Uh, how's it affecting your sleep? You know how's um, you know how's your overall strength in the gym? Like how's your endurance? How's um, how's like your uh, your your sleep and, and all these other things like you got to make sure like you're, you're considering your digestion, for instance, like all these other factors involved. So that way you still have an indication on progress. Yeah. If your body's getting healthier, if you have any signs of improved health and vitality, you're not plateauing. 
plateau as everything kind of stops. And at that point, then evaluate what you're doing. And then this is a good time to add something else. You if talk, it feels right. Talk though about how, how important, I mean, this was something that it took me a long time as a trainer to get good at communicating that to a client because clients many times can can attach their success purely to like one metric, right? Yeah. How I look in the mirror or the scale. And if those things are slowing down, but to Justin's point, digestion is getting be better. My sleep is getting yep. better. My all energy right. levels are getting better. Like, hey, those, those are all great indicators that we're moving in the right direction. Even though you may be discouraged because you, you paid for this year of training with me because you want to look a certain way. Trust me, we're moving in the right direction. If your body is giving us all these signals back, that's improving. Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing well. You yeah. Usually, you'll get the physiological feelings of energy and strength and mobility, and those will improve, 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 and then the aesthetics start to change. The aesthetics tend to reflect... Uh, improvements in vitality. So just like building muscle, like if you go to the gym and your, your goal, let's say your goal is to build muscle and you add five pounds to your, your squat. And then you go back the next time you add five pounds to your squat. And then you go back to the next time you add five pounds to your squat. You probably didn't build or notice any muscle built that entire time. But at, eventually at some point, you're going to add weight to the bar, weight to the bar, weight to the bar. And then the muscle just pops on your body. Like there's the aesthetic result. So uh, all, you want to look at everything. You want to look at all the metrics of health and vitality. And if none of them are moving forward, or if you start to feel, uh, you know, like this just isn't working anymore, but, but be objective, then you can add something like additional exercise or, uh, you, know, you know, more sets or add weight or, you know, cut calories a little more, but wait until you get to that point. You know, <clears throat> you didn't have this in your list, but this is something that I like to do for that that exact reason is I I have all my clients uh, take a photo of themselves from the front side and back, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Friday mornings, first thing when they wake up. That's like, yeah. and, and we do it every week, but I want to refer back to it once a month. And so part of our, are we on track? Are we seeing results? Are we, are, we, are we actually moving in the right direction? I want to take a look at the difference between picture one and then the fourth picture after that and be able to say like, can we see a noticeable difference between weeks one and four? Because sometimes we will see the stall on like the, on the weight, right? If we're doing such a good job of reducing body fat while also slowly building muscle, there's a good chance 30 days goes by and we see absolutely no movement on the scale. And because we look at ourselves in the mirror every single day, mm -hmm. multiple times a day, sometimes then it's hard for us to see these, these subtle changes that are happening. So having these, these pictures that we track every week, I love to use that as a like, hey, I know you don't think you've changed much, but look at right here. Look at this picture when we first started. This is just four weeks later. And even though the scale is the same, look at how different your body composition is. Right. Train and eat to feel good, not to look good. All right. So why is this such an important one? Well, first off, there's nothing wrong with working out and eating to change how you look. But here's the problem with it, okay? It's not inherently bad or inherently wrong. But when you're training and when when what's directing your workouts and your diet is the reflection in the mirror, you're far more likely to make decisions that are not good for you or not beneficial or appropriate versus when you're working out and eating to feel good. So, what do I mean by that? Well, if it's all about what the scale says and the mirror says, which of course is very subjective, so is feeling is very subjective, but boy, can the mirror be uh, quite an evil, subjective, um, you know, enemy. When you're doing it that way and all of a sudden you look at the mirror, oh, I don't, uh-oh, am I puffy today? Am I a little heavy? Or I don't see that bicep vein or whatever. Then you're more likely to ignore the signs of your body. You feel bad, I'm going to the gym anyway. I, I, I'm supposed to have an easy workout today, but I'm gonna beat myself up anyway. Um, or I'm going to force myself to eat this way because I hate the way I look type of deal. And then you develop this kind of bad relationship with food, which eventually you rebel from versus how do I feel? Well, I feel energized. I'm going to have a hard workout or I feel tired. You know what? I'm going to go easy to my workout or I'm stiff. You know what? Today's a mobility day. I'm not going to do the, the heavy lifting or diet. Hey, I know I'm supposed to eat this particular way to lose weight or to whatever, but my digestion's off. So I really need to shift to these foods that help my digestion or these foods that help my energy or these foods that help my, my mood because I notice when I eat this other way, I get moody. If you train and eat 
to feel good, and I mean the truest sense, to feel good, not just the impulsive hedonistic feel good that we'll get temporarily, but the actual true feeling good, you're more likely to make the right decisions. And those decisions are more likely to make you look good. So the irony of what I'm saying is you'll look good, we're more likely to look good if you do this to feel good versus the other way around. Yeah, the more in tune you are with your body's natural signals, the better you're going to recover and then adapt and move forward in your progress. And, and that's like a really hard concept for people because to Adam's point always, it's like this, like it doesn't make sense in any other uh, thing or pursuit that you do in terms of my work um, that I'm, I'm pursuing to be the best at or... Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, stress and sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. Um, you know, learning the more than anybody else I put in like nothing but hard work and then it pays off. And, um, and this is just one of those things that you have to really listen to your body's ability to, to communicate with you as to whether or not I feel tight, restricted, whether I feel like I have zero energy, whether I feel like I just, you know, maybe, maybe I can get after it and go a little more intense right now. Like you, you got to really pick, pick up on those signals and peer into that because that's really where, um, you know, it's not going to lead you astray. And so to, to do that, a lot of times, you know, if you're just looking at the mirror, you're just looking at this visual uh, perception of yourself, like it's not going to tell you, uh, the whole story. A lot of times it's, it's, it's going to, uh, create this idea that I need to to go harder and I'm going to train hard, which then you're going to interrupt your recovery, which then puts you in this sort of hamster wheel. Along those lines, your body doesn't communicate to you through the mirror, nor the scale. Your body communicates to you by the way you feel. So if you want to listen to your body, basing it off of how you look is not listening to your body. In fact, it's ignoring. It's actually encouraging to ignore what your body's telling you. Well, the reason why this is such a good tip is, and we actually just recently talked about this, You, no matter what, you eventually have to move this way, right? You don't have to tell anybody who's just getting started on their journey that, how to motivate them to want to look better. Most people come into the gym that way. Almost all of us were motivated because I want to look better and that's why I'm here. Like That's easy. Most people feel that already. But if you want this to be sustainable long-term and you want to continue this as a, as a, as a lifestyle, You'll have to move away from just the way you look to learning all these other things, which is why we always teach our clients to, to start looking at these things. It's like, yes, I know you want to lose 100 pounds. Yes, I know you want to look like a certain way that you used to look before or whatever, but I also want you to be connected to your sleep, your mood, your libido, your hair, your skin, your energy level, like all these other things you've got to learn to be connected to because those are the things that are after you get and obtain this look that you want, like that's what's going to sustain you long term. And you're better off learning to connect the foods and the way you eat to how those things make you feel better because it's going to be more sustainable. Also, if you're going into 2024 and you, I mean, if you had everything identical, two people identical, identical, identical situations, one listened to how their body felt. The other one just looked at the mirror and chased the look. At the end of that year, the person who chased the feeling good would look better. Yep. So it's also the faster, better way to get there. Right. So that's the kicker. And the next thing you want to add is the is the intensity of your workouts. You can make your workouts a little harder. After this, then you can add more workouts. But I tell people to focus on this first because, I mean, just to give an example. I trained Doug was a client of mine, and he was experienced. He wasn't a total beginner. He worked out twice a week for six, seven months before adding an extra day. So for six or seven months, we got great results two days a week. Now the workouts changed, right? The workouts weren't the same. We added intensity and load the entire time. But once we got to the point where there wasn't much we could do additionally with those two days a week, then we threw that extra day. So the, so the, so the first thing I would say to change with the workouts is the intensity. You make them a little harder, challenge yourself a little more. And then this is where... This is where I like to add now a diet, a specific diet target, okay? Mm. And I like to tell people here to hit protein targets. Let's just focus on that for now. And typically what you want to do is you want to take your body weight and you want to try and hit that in grams of protein. If you're really overweight, then take your goal weight and hit that number in protein. So if you want to lose 30 pounds, which brings you down to 130, try and hit 130 grams of protein a day and prioritize that and do that uh, with every single meal. And what'll happen is protein is very satiating, tends to make you eat less, 
More protein builds more muscle. That's going to look better. It's going to feel better. It's going to speed up your metabolism. Um, and it leads to uh, typically better consumption habits. So hit protein targets at this point is typically what I tell people. I, I want to touch more on the increase intensity uh, just because this is top of mind for me. Uh, Katrina is actually helping uh, two of her close friends uh, through this process of following a mass program, eating better. And, you know, sh these friends of hers are, you know, chronic yo-yo dieters and going from you know, on off wagon. And, you know, she's been trying to get them to just like trust the process with her. And they started both of them. This has been, we're a couple months in, actually we're several months in now. And the, uh, they both around the same time started to hit this plateau and Katrina was mm -hmm. coming to me and she's like, you know, Hey, they're, they're, they're falling there on this phase of maps and, you know, they're sticking to the diet and all these things like that. But they're, they're at like a really bad plateau. And I said, you know, when, and this is really common, especially with my, my female clients, like my, my female clients were always really good about like following the plan. If I told them to do this, they, they stuck to it, but they're also tend to weigh on like the, the safer side, the opposite mm -hmm. of my guys when it comes to lifting. And so, and they think they're just doing as they're told, like following the program as it's laid out, but they're not trying to uh, stretch themselves, you know, every workout or every few workouts. Like, can I lift more with good form? That's right. right. And, and and quickly, I, it didn't take me long of inquiring about their routine. And she remember her reporting back to me. I said, well, where was their, where was their bench class, the big lifts, right? I'm like, where was it when they first started and what are they doing right now? And they're literally like lifting the same weights, same weight. yeah. you know, three months it's later. And I said, listen, I can, I can, I can look at her and tell you right now, she is much stronger than I can. I know if I was training her, she'd be squatting way more than that. She'd be over. I know I could get her to that. I can just, I can see the muscle she has on her body. I said, I want you to get a lift with each of them. And then you know how to push. I've trained you long enough. You know how to increase that intensity. Make sure you challenge them. And when it says play things in our program where it's like eight to 10 reps, I want you to challenge them to find a weight that they have a hard time getting to eight for them. Now, mind you, we coach differently on the podcast about two in the tank. But when it comes to teaching somebody how to increase intensity, many times it's because they're kind of following this routine, <clears throat> sticking to the same weight weeks and weeks. Oh and yeah, months and months. You, you ask them in the gym. I would ask people like, "Oh, I do. You know, I do. This is my routine. I do shoulder press and I do a row and I, and oh, and I use the ten pound dumbbells for the shoulder press and I use the fifteen pound dumbbells for the rows and I put this weight stack uh -huh. at seventy pounds." And you know, and you're like, how long have you been doing yeah. that? Yes. Like, oh, five years. Well, I always do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. You know that with, they, they're just going in and plugging in the numbers. No, no, no. You got to increase the, resi the resistance. You got to get stronger. Otherwise, your body will improve to handle that load. And then that's it. it has got no reason. Now you'll maintain, but you're not going to progress at all. So increasing the intensity, that's a part of it. Like get yourself stronger, but also hit those targets in protein and then worry about everything else. Me meaning, when you're eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, center the meal around the protein, eat the protein, and then move on to the rest. And studies will show that this does result in a reduction in calories. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you'll hit your protein targets, which builds uh, Well, I mean, simply yeah. just that alone. I mean, we had a you know podcast live call just recently that we talked about that. This, to me, is the one of the most common mistakes, especially for my female clients that are trying to build muscle, speed the metabolism up, is not consistently hitting protein. And a lot of times I won't even worry about the rest of the diet. Other than that, it's just like, yeah. let's, let's get to a place where you can literally tell me, Hey, Adam, 30 days. And I hit what my body needs protein wise every single day. And I bet you, you will see a difference just from doing that because you can train consistently and as hard as you want uh, all day long. But if you don't give your body the uh, adequate protein for it to build muscle, then you're just going to get really the benefits of burning calories and you're going to build very, very little muscle and maybe That's, a little bit of the beginner newbie gains. Right. But after that, the body adapts and then you're not going to see anything until you start to increase. Yeah, and that not protein. to mention, like I said, it contributes to just eating better overall because it's such a satiation. That's why I didn't have to focus on it. That right. was, that was a, a, a byproduct that I didn't, I didn't realize was going to happen was, Oh, wow. When I got my clients just to focus on that, I didn't need to tell them, oh, back off the saturated fat or, oh, it decrease the calories because it was so hard for them right. to consistently hit that. They, they would get they would get full. They get full off all that protein. So I, it would naturally restrict all these other calories, carbohydrates, saturated fats. So all I had to do was just focus on the protein. The data on sleep is, uh, I mean, it's unequivocal. It's, it, it's very, very important for health, behaviors, fat loss, muscle gain, hormones. 
But there's a lot of things we can do to improve our sleep, or there's a lot of knobs we can turn to try to improve our sleep. But one of them, or many of them, have big effects. Others have much smaller effects, right? Like smaller effect, blue light blocking glasses before you go to bed. Everybody talks about that. What's the effect? That's eh, You get an effect, but it's not this big, profound one. Well, when you look at the data on sleep, it's now becoming quite clear that there's something that almost everybody does that has profoundly negative effects on the quality of your sleep. And that's the following. They go to bed at the same time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday night, they go to bed late. They try to sleep in Saturday. They go to bed late Saturday. They try to sleep in Sunday. They go to bed Sunday. Now I got to wake up early again on Monday. And they're giving themselves jet lag every single week. jet lag. Every single week. Every week, people's circadian rhythms are forced to shift. The data on changing your circadian rhythm on people that travel often, on people that work swing shifts is clear. It's terrible for health, terrible for hormones, terrible for muscle building, terrible for fat loss. It's not good for anything. So one of the best, most profound things you can do with the big impact when it comes to sleep is simply this, this right here. You don't have to do anything else but this and you'll have a big impact. Go to bed at the same time every night and wake up at the same time every day. If you just did that, most people would see incredible incredible improvements in their sleep quality and the benefits that come along with that. This one hits home for me mm -hmm. so much right now because more more than ever have I hopped around time zones, right? I think we were in four different time zones oh, yeah. over the last month, right? Which I don't think that's ever happened to me where I've been in four different time zones in one month. Actually, it was in two and a half weeks. And I've had the hardest time getting back to my sleep routine and my training routine because of that. Like I can't remember the last time that I struggled to like really get good night's rest consistently for two or three days and get my training back. Mm -hmm. And so this is, it, to me, it's just this, this is this microcosm of what happens to some people that are constantly traveling or stay up till two in the morning one time and then go to bed at eight o'clock another time. And then like up early and then up later, like, man, I can only imagine doing that and then also trying to be consistent with my nutrition and training because I can feel what that feels like right now. And I'm like, God, that would be so difficult. So this is such a good tip uh, because you don't realize how much how much more difficult you make it for yourself. It's not like you can't get shredded and fit and be inconsistent about your bedtime, just that you make it a lot harder for yourself mm -hmm. by doing that. A lot harder. And this is why everybody hates Mondays is because <laughs> they literally shifted their circadian rhythm over the weekend and then forced it to go back. Yeah. And they're jet lagged. They feel like Another absolute. case of the Mondays. And they feel like absolute garbage. This is when you're just moving more. This is when you add workouts. This is when you add extra steps in your day. This is also now where you could start to aim for other, other macro targets. So if you've gotten good at eating your 130 grams of protein a day, let's say that's your target, and it's pretty consistent and you can do it and you know what that looks like, now you can look at your overall calories and say, okay, I want to eat this many grams of carbohydrates, this many grams of fats. Let me see if I can hit these. Now I'm going to be quite honest. If you don't get to this part, you're still going to get pretty damn far. Mm -hmm. But if you get to this part, it's because you've gotten far and you want to take it to the next level. This is really when things, this is when you get that last, you know, you know, 3% body fat off your body. When you get that last five to 10 pounds, that's kind of stuck. It's when you push this and you start to track all the macros or aim for macro targets, add a little activity. And then this is when you hit that final goal that you have. Oh, I, I would make the case that you'll build the best body you've ever built. And That's the title of the episode. With, so. <laughs> <laughs> with just yeah. simply hitting your protein and calorie targets. I, I, the carbohydrates and fat and stuff like that, unless you're doing something like my sister-in-law, which was grossly under consuming fiber and I had to adjust her fiber yeah. intake because she was having digestive issues. Like unless you are doing something like that, simply focusing on just hitting your protein and staying within your, your calorie budget is normally enough to completely change the body in, in any direction you really want to go. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.